Hey guys, this is Allison from Alley Cat Creations. How are you? Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. I don't know why that happens. Either way, please subscribe to the channel. That helps me sharing, helps me get around, get the messages out, and... If you get anything from my work, a connected dot, an epiphany, a mind blown moment, a new author to read, a new book to explore, artwork to check out, oracle cards. I do those readings in my spiritual soul advice videos. So if you're interested in any of those things, all the links to help me and keep me going are at the bottom of the description. Check out my artwork at alleycatcreations211.com. I, I just put together some more keychains that has gems and medals in them for the kiddos. I have necklaces that I make. Pyramids, all kinds of good stuff. So check that out. It's another way you can support me and get something really cool. And I don't, I'm not expensive compared to other people who make organite and pyramids and artwork. Hi. I broke my desk chair. I have to see if I can Jimmy rig it. But in the meantime, Still morning here. Another day that I woke up early and we're going to get work done today. So today we're going to tackle paper 62, the dawn races of early man. Now, before I start, I just want to put this out there. I don't necessarily agree with the perceptions of most of the books that I read, the Wasp Bay definitely don't. And even in here, there are some things that I do align with and other things I don't. That doesn't mean that you won't. So if I make a criticism or something, it's just me not aligning with it, but you might, and that's okay. I'm trying to keep the camera. It it's off of my computer, so I do apologize. It's been really bonkers, to say the least. About one million years ago, the immediate ancestors of mankind made their appearance by three successive and sudden mutations stemming from early stock of the lemur type, a placenta mammal. The dominant factors of these early lemurs were derived from the Western or later American group of the evolving life plasm. But before establishing the direct line of human ancestry, the strain was reinforced by contributions from the central life implantation evolved in Africa. The Eastern life group contributed little or nothing to the actual production of human species. The early lemur types. The early lemur types concerned in the ancestry of the human species were not directly related to the pre existent tribes of gibbons and apes, then living in Eurasia and northern Africa, whose progeny have survived to the present time. Neither were they the offspring of the modern type of lemur through springing from an ancestor group to both but long since extinct. While these early lemurs evolved in the Western Hemisphere, the establishment of the direct mammalian ancestry of mankind took place in south, Southwestern Asia, in the original area of the central life implantation, but on the borders of the Eastern regions. Several million years ago, the North American type lemurs had migrated westward over the Burling Land Bridge and had slowly made their way 
the salubrious region lying between them and expanded Mediterranean Sea and elevating mountainous regions of India, Indian Peninsula. In these lands to the west of India, they united with another and favorable strains, thus establishing the ancestry of the human race. When the passing of time, the seacoast of India southwest of the mountains gradually submerged, completely isolating the life of this region. There was no avenue of approach or escape from the Mesopotamian or Persian Peninsula, except to the north, and that was repeatedly cut off by the southern invasions of the glaciers. And it was in this then almost para distical area and from the superior descendants of this lemur type of mammal that there sprang two great groups, the simian tribes and modern times and the present day human species. The dawn mammals. A little more than 1 million years ago, the Mesopotamian dawn mammals the direct descendants of the North American lemur type of placental mammal suddenly appeared. They were active little creatures, almost three feet tall. While they did not habitually walk on their hind legs, they could easily stand erect. They were hairy and agile, chattered in monkey-like fashion, but unlike the simian tribes, they were flesh eaters. They had a primitive opposable thumb, as well as a highly useful grasping big toe. From this point onward, the pre-human species successfully developed the opposable thumb while they progressively lost the grasping power of the great toe. The later ape tribes retained the grasping big toe, but never developed the human type of thumb. These dawn mammals obtained full growth when three or four years of age, having a potential lifespan on the average of about 20 years. As a rule, offspring were born singly, although twins were occasional. The members of this new species had the largest brains for their size of any animal that had their two four existed on earth. They experienced many of the emotions and shared numerous instincts, which later characterized primitive man, being highly curious and exhibiting considerable elation when successful at any undertaking. Food hunger and sex craving were well-developed and a definite sex selection was manifested in a crude form of courtship and course of mates. They would fight fiercely in defense of their kindred and were quite tender to in, in family associations, possessing a sense of self-abasement bordering on shame and remorse. They were very affectionate and touchingly loyal to their mates, but if circumstances separated them, they would choose new partners. Being small of stature and having keen minds to realize the dangers of their forest habitat, they developed an extraordinary fear which led to those wise precautionary measures that so enormously contributed to survival such as their construction of crude shelters in the high tree tops, which eliminated many of the perils of ground life. The beginning of the fear tendencies of mankind more specifically dates from these days. These dawn mammals developed more of a tribal spirit than had ever been previously exhibited. They were indeed highly gregarious, but nevertheless exceedingly pugnacious, when in any way disturbed in the ordinary pursuit of their routine life, and they displayed fiery tempers when their anger was fully aroused. Their bellicose natures, however, served a, gr a good purpose. Superior groups <coughs> sorry, did not hesitate to make war on their inferior neighbors, and thus by selective survival, the species was progressively improved. They very soon dominated the life of the smaller creatures of this region, and very few of the old non-carnivious -car monkey-like tribes survived. These aggressive little animals multiplied and spread over the Mesopotamian Peninsula for more than 1,000 years, constantly improving in physical type and general intelligence. And it was just 70 generations after this new tribe had taken origin from the highest type of lemur ancestor 
that the next epoch making development occurred, the sudden differentiation of the ancestors of the next vital step in the evolution of human beings on Urantia. The mid mammals. Early in the career of the dawn mammals in the treetop abode of superior pair of these agile creatures, twins were born, one male and one female. Compared with their ancestors, they were really handsome little creatures. They had little hair on their bodies, but this was no disability as they lived in a warm and e equitable climate. These children grew to be a little over four feet in height. They were in every way larger than their parents, having longer legs and shorter arms. They had almost perfect opposable thumbs, just about as well adapted for diversified work as the present human thumb. They walked upright, having feet almost as well suited for walking as those of the later human races. Their brains were inferior to and smaller than those of human beings, but very superior to and comparatively much larger than those of the ancestors. The twins early displayed superior intelligence and were soon recognized as the heads of the whole tribe of dawn mammals, really instituting a primitive form of social organization and a crude economic division of labor. This brother and sister mated and soon enjoyed the society of 21 children, much like themselves, all more than four feet tall and in every way superior to the ancestral species. This new group formed the nucleus of the mid mammals. When the numbers of this new and superior group grew great, war, relentless war, broke out. And when the terrible struggle was over, not a single individual of the pre-existent ancestral race of dawn mammals remained alive. The less numerous but more powerful and intelligent offshoot of the species had survived at the expense of their ancestors. And now for almost 15,000 years, 600 generations, this creature became the terror of this part of the world. All of the great and vicious animals of former times had perished. The large beasts native to those regions were not carnivorous, and the largest species of the cat family, lions, tigers, had not yet invaded this particularly sheltered nook of the Earth's surface. Therefore, did these mid-mammals wax valiant and subdue the whole of their corner of creation. Compared with the ancestral species, the mid-mammals were an improvement in every way. Even their potential lifespan was longer, being about 25 years. A number of rudimentary human traits appeared in this new species. In addition to the innate propensities exhibited by their ancestors, these mid-mammals were capable of showing disgust in certain repulsive situations. They further possessed a well-defined hoarding instinct they would hide food for subsequent use and were greatly given to the collection of smooth round pebbles, certain types of round stones suitable for defense and offensive ammunition. These mid mammals were the first to exhibit a definite construction propensity. As soon in their rivalry in the building of both treetop homes and their many tunneled subterranean retreats, they were the first species of mammals ever to provide for safety in both arboreal and underground shelters. They largely forsook the trees as places of abode, living on the ground during the day and sleeping in the treetops at night. As time passed, and that the nat natural increase in numbers eventually resulted in serious food competition and sex rivalry, all of which culminated in a series of inter- internecine battles that nearly destroyed the entire species. These struggles continued only until one group of less than 100 individuals was left alive, but peace once more prevailed, and this alone surviving tribe built anew its treetop bedrooms and once again resumed the normal and semi-peaceful existence. You can hardly realize by what narrow margins your pre-human ancestors missed extinction from time to time, had the ancestral frog of all humanity jumped two inches less on a certain occasion, the whole course of evolution would have been markedly changed. The immediate lemur-like mother of the dawn mammal species escaped death no less than five times by mere hair margins. 
before she gave birth to the father of the new and higher mammalian order. But the closest call of all was when lightning struck the tree in which the prospective mother of the primate's twins was sleeping. Both of these mid-mammal parents were severely shocked and barely burned. Three of their seven children were killed by this bolt from the skies. These evolving animals were almost superstitious. This couple whose treetop home had been struck were really the leaders of a more progressive group of the mid-mammalian species and following their example, more than half the tribe embracing the more intelligent fam excuse me, families moved about two miles away from this locality and began the construction of new treetop abodes and new ground shelters, yet transient retreats in time of sudden danger. Soon after the completion of their homes, this couple veterans of so many struggles found themselves the proud parents of twins. The most interesting and most important animals ever to have been born into the world up to that time, for they were the first of the new species of primates constituting the new vital step in pre-human evolution. Contemporaneously with the birth of the primate twins, another couple of peculiar retarded male and female of the mid mammal tribe, a couple that were both mentally and physically inferior, also gave birth to twins. These twins, one male and one female, were indifferent to conquest. They were concerned only with obtaining food, and since they were not flesh, eat will not eat flesh, soon lost all interest in seeking prey. These retarded twins became the founders of the modern simian tribes. Their descendants sought the warmer southern regions with their mild climates and an abundance of tropical fruits, where they have continued much as of this day, except for those branches which mate with the earlier types of gibbons and apes and have greatly de deteriorated in consequence. And so it may be readily seen that man and the ape are related only in that they sprang from the mid-mammals, a tribe in which they occurred the contem contemporaneousness, birth, and subsequent segregation of two pairs of twins, the inferior pair destined to produce the modern types of monkeys, baboons, chimpanzee, and gorilla, the superior pair destined to continue the line of ascent, which evolved into man himself. Modern man and the simians did spring from the same tribe and species, but not from the same parents. Man's ancestors are descended from the superior strains of the selected remnant of this mid-mammal tribe, whereas the modern simians, excepting certain pre-existent types of lemurs, gibbons, apes, and other monkey-like creatures, are the descendants of the most inferior couple of the mid-mammalian group, a couple who only survived by hiding themselves in a subterranean food storage retreat for more than two weeks during the last fierce battle of their tribe emerging only after the hostilities were well over. See, I don't know, I don't align with this paradigm because it's not of my structure. Ashiana Dean touches us with a 10 foot pole and it's really good. So check out the Voyager's books because she gives a different spin. The evolution of man is different depending what paradigm you align with. So I'm not saying this didn't happen. I'm just saying this is not my paradigm that I belong to. See the difference? Yeah. Sorry, I had a glitch going on in my internet. So I hope this is back on. The primates. Going back to the birth of the superior twins, one male and one female, to the two leading members of the mid-mammal -mam tribe, these animal babies were of an unusual order. They had less hair on their bodies than their parents, and when very young, insisted on walking upright. Their ancestors had always learned to walk on their hind legs, but these primate twins stood erect from the beginning. They obtained a height over five feet and their heads grew larger in comparison with others among the tribe. While early learning to communicate with each other 
By means of signals and sounds, they were never able to make their people understand these new symbols. When about 14 years of age, they fled from the tribe going west to raise their family and establish new species of primates. And these new creatures are very popularly dominated primates since they were the direct and immediate animal ancestors of the human family itself. Thus, it was the primates came to occupy a region on the west coast of the Mesopotamian Peninsula as it then projected into the southern sea. While the less intelligent and closely related tribes lived among the peninsula point and up the eastern shoreline, the primates were more human and less animal than their mid-mammal predecessors. The skeletal proportions of this new species were very similar to those of the primate primitive human races. The human type of hand and foot had fully developed and these creatures could walk and even run as well as any other later day human descendants. They largely abandoned tree life, though continuing to resort to the treetops as a safety measure at night. But like their earlier ancestors, they were greatly subject to fear. The increased use of their hands did much to develop inherent brain power, but they did not yet possess minds that could really be called human. Although in emotional nature, the primates differed little from their forefathers, they exhibited more of human trend in all their pro propensities. They were indeed splendid and superior animals, reaching maturity at about 10 years of age and having a natural lifespan of about 40 years. That is, they might have lived that long had they died natural deaths, but those early days where very few animals ever died a natural death, the struggle for existence was altogether too intense. And now, after almost 900 generations of development, covering about 21,000 years from the origin of the dawn mammals, the primates suddenly gave birth to two remarkable creatures, the first true human beings. This it was that the dawn mammals springing from the North American lemur type gave origin to the mid mammals. Then these mid mammals in turn produced the superior primates who became the immediate ancestors of the primitive human race. The primate tribes were the last vital link in the evolution of man. But in less than 5,000 years, not a single individual of these extraordinary tribes was left. The first human beings from the year A.D. 1934 back to the birth of the first two human beings is just 993,419 years. These two remarkable creatures were true human beings. They possessed perfect human thumbs, as had many of their ancestors, while they had just as perfect feet as the present-day human races. They were walkers and runners, not climbers. The grasping function of the big toe was absent, completely absent. When danger drove them to the treetops, they climbed like the humans of today would. They would climb up the trunk of a tree like a bear and not as would a chimpanzee or gorilla swinging by the branches. These first human beings and their descendants reach full maturity at 12 years of age and possess a potential lifespan about 75 years. Many new emotions early appeared in these human twins. They experienced admiration for both objects and other beings and exhibited considerable vanity. But the most remarkable advance in emotional development was the sudden appearance of a new group of really human feelings. The worshipful group embracing awe, reverence, humility, and even a primitive form of gratitude. Fear joined in with ignorance of natural phenomena is about to give birth to primitive religion. Not only were such human feelings manifested in these primitive humans, but many more highly evolved sentiments were also present in rudimentary form they were mightily cognized of pity, shame, and reproach, and were acutely conscious of love, hate, and revenge, being also susceptible to marked feelings of jealousy. These first two humans, the twins, were a great trial to their primitive parents. 
They were so curious and adventurous that they nearly lost their lives on numerous occasions before they were eight years old, as it was. They were rather well scarred up by the time they were 12. Very early, they learned to engage in verbal communication. By the age of 10, they had worked out an improved sign and word language of almost half a hundred ideas and half greatly improved and expanded the crude communication technique of their ancestors. But try as hard as they might, they were able to teach only a few of their new signs and symbols to their parents. When about nine years of age, they journeyed off down the river one bright day and held a momentous conference. Every celestial intelligence stationed on Urantia, including myself, was present as an observer of the transactions of this noon tide trist. On this eventful day, they arrived at an understanding to live with and for each other. And this was the first of a series of such agreements which finally culminated in the decision to flee from their inferior animal associations and to journey northward, little knowing that they were thus to find the human race. While we were all greatly concerned with what those two little savages were planning, we were powerless to control the workings of their minds and we did not, could not arbitrarily influence their decisions. But within the permissible limits of planetary function, we, the life carriers, together with our associates, all conspired to lead the human twins northward and far from their hairy right, partially -dwell tree-dwelling people. And so by reason of their own intelligence and choice, the twins did migrate, and because of our su supervision, they migrated northward to a secluded region where they escaped the possibility of biologic de degradation through a mixture with the inferior relatives of the primitive tribes. Shortly before their departure from the home forest, they lost their mother in a gibbon raid. While she did not possess their intelligence, she did have a worthy mammalian afflict affection of higher order for her offspring and she fearlessly gave her life in the attempt to save the wonderful pair. Nor was her sacrifice in vain, for she held off the enemy until the father arrived with reinforcements and put the invaders to rout. Soon after this young couple forsook their associations to find the human race, their prim primate father became disconsolate. He was heartbroken. He refused to eat even when food was brought to him by his other children. His brilliant offspring, having been lost, life, did not seem worth living among his ordinary fellows. See, he wandered off into the forest, was set upon by hostile gibbons, and beaten to death. Evolution of the Human Mind We, the life carriers on Urantia, had passed through the long vigil of watching waiting since the day we first planted the life plasm in the planetary waters naturally the appearance of the first really intelligent and volitional beings brought us great joy and supreme satisfaction we had been watching the twins develop mentally through our observation of functioning of the seven adjudant mind spirits assigned to urantia at the time of our arrival on the planet Throughout the long evolutionary development of planetary life, these tireless mind ministers had even registered their increasing ability to contact with successfully expanding brain capacities of the progressively superior animal creatures. At first, only the spirit of intuition could function in the instinctive and reflex behavior of the primordial animal life. With the differentiation of higher types, the spirit of understanding was able to endow such creatures with the gift of spontaneous association of ideas. Later on, we observed the spirit of courage in operation. Evolving animals really developed a crude form of protective self-consciousness. Subsequent to the appearance of the mammalian groups, we beheld the spirit of knowledge manifesting itself in increased measure and the evolution of the higher mammals brought the function of the spirit of counsel with the resulting growth of the herd instinct and beginnings of primitive social development. Increasingly <clears throat> on down, 
Through the dawn mammals and mid mammals and primates, we had observed the augmented service of their first five adjudic adjudicants, but never had the remaining two, the highest mind ministers, been able to function in the Arantia type of evolutionary mind. Imagine our joy one day, the twins were about 10 years old, when the spirit of worship made its first contact with the mind of the female twin and shortly thereafter with the male. We knew that something closely akin to human mind was approaching culmination. And when about a year later, they finally resolved as a result of meditative thought and pur purposeful decision to flee from home and journey north. Then did the spirit of wisdom begin to function on Urantia and in these two now recognized human minds. There was an immediate new order of mobilization of the seven adjudicant mind spirits. We were alive with expectations. We realized that the long waited for hour was approaching. We knew we were upon the threshold of realization of our protracted effort to evolve with creatures on Urantia. Recognition as an inherited world. We did not have to wait long at noon the day after the runways of the twins. There occurred the initial test flash of the universe circuit signals on the planetary reception for focus of Urantia. We were, of course, all astir with the realization that a great event was impending. But since this world was a life experiment station, we had not the slightest idea of just how we would be appraised of the recognition of intelligent life on the planet. But we were not long in suspense on the third day after the elopement of the twins and before the life carrier corpse departed, there arrived the Nebadon Archangel of, initiate, of initial planetary circuit establishment. It was an eventful day on Urantia when our small group was gathered about the planetary pole of space communication and received the first message of Salvington over the new, newly established mind circuit of the planet. And this first message dictated by the chief of the Archangel Corp said, To the life carriers of Urantia, greetings. We transmit an assurance of great pleasure on Salvington, Edentia, and Jerusalem in honor of the registration of the headquarters of Nebadon of the signal and the existence on Urantia of mind of will dignity. The purposeful decision of the twins to flee northward and segregate their offspring from their inferior ancestors had been noted. This is the first decision of mind, the human type of mind on your rancha, and automatically establishes a circuit of communication over which this initial message of acknowledgement is transmitting. Next over these new circuit came greetings of the most highs of Edentia containing instructions for the resident life carriers forbidding us to interfere with the pattern of life we have established. We were directed not to intervene in the affairs of human progress. It should not be interfered that life carriers even arbitrarily and plans for we do not. But up to this time, we had been permitted to manipulate the environment and shield the life plasm in a special manner and it was the extraordinary but holy nature supervision that was to be discontinued. And no sooner had the most highest highs left off speaking with the beautiful message of Lucifer, the sovereign of the Satania system, began to planetize. Now the life carriers heard the welcome words of their own chief and received his permission to return to Jerusalem. This message from Lucifer contained the official acceptance of the life carrier's work on Urantia and absolved us from all future criticism of any of our efforts to improve the life patterns of Nebadon as established on Satania system. These messages from Salvington, Edentia, and Jerusalem formally marked the termination of the life carrier's age-long supervision of the planet. For ages, we have been on duty, assisted only by the seven adjutant mind spirits and the master physical controllers. And now, will the power of choosing to worship and ascend, having appeared to the evolutionary creatures on the planet, we realized that our work was finished and our group prepared to depart. Urantia being a life modification world, permission was granted to leave 
behind two senior life carriers with 12 assistants. And I was chosen as one of this group and have ever since been on Urantia. It is just 993,408 years ago from the year AD 1934 that Urantia was formally recognized as a planet of human habitation in the universe of Nebadon. Biologic evolution had once again achieved the human levels of will dignity. Man had arrived on the planet 606 of Satania. Sponsored by a life carrier of Nebadon, resident of Urantia. Interesting. But I digress. So guys, I don't know what happened. I had some glitches happening. I um, hope this video comes out okay. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Next time, paper 63, the first human family will be read. This camera is still pissing me off. Sorry about that. So guys, sending you love, light, compassion, grace, protection, and shielding energy. Please be safe, be seen. I hope you all have a great rest of your week. And I hope to see you on the next one. Bye, guys.